tell you, since I've been in the museum, which is a very long time, I have looked at every single one of our inscriptions. I haven't read them all completely, but I've looked at them all, so I know what's there. And when this member of the public brought in this other tablet on that particular afternoon, it changed everything, because this tablet was more interesting and had more information on it than you could hardly believe, because it was about this big, about the size of a mobile phone, and it had 60 lines of writing on, and when I looked at it, I could see straight away that it came from this tremendously important story about the flood and the destruction of the world and the rescue by building a boat, which everybody, of course, knows from the Bible. And this was the same story from Mesopotamia. And although we'd had a few before, even in the British Museum, we've got some bits of the story, this was a long description with lots of new information so in it. What is new? Because there was already a story from 1872. That's right. One of, uh, yes, one of, my, one of my predecessors was the first person ever to discover that this story existed in ancient Babylonia. So in the 19th century there was a lot of fuss about it because all the clergymen, they couldn't understand how the holy sacred text of the book of Genesis appeared on one of these strange objects. So for quite a long time um, people knew there was a story, but this particular tablet had lots of brand new information. The most important thing was it described what the boat was like, which had to be built, and it was a round boat. And no one would ever have this idea in their minds to imagine that the ark to rescue life would be a round boat. It would be a strange thing. But in Iraq, the modern equivalent of Mesopotamia and in ancient times, the people who lived by the rivers, they used these round boats, coracles we sometimes call them, to cross the river and to fish from and things of this kind. And the poet who wrote this version of the story on that tablet, his idea was that the boat to rescue all life would be a huge example of a round boat. And it was a good idea, I tell you why, because um, these boats, although they're quite difficult to steer, and they sometimes go round and round like that, they never sink. And in the story of rescuing the animals for the long future of the, of the globe, the important thing was that it didn't sink, so they didn't get drowned. That was the only thing that was important. So he wrote this description, but he gave all the information about it, how much uh, material you would need, how big it was going to be, how you built it, and it was all dictated to this Babylonian hero who was supposed to build it. So there it was, all the instructions. But, but you said that he was a poet, the one who wrote the, the, this tablet? Definitely. But it sounds more like an engineering book. Well, that's a good point. But you see, the thing is this. When this tablet was written in about 1700 BC, something like that, um, at that time, in the villages of Mesopotamia, there were people who went round telling stories. They were travelling storytellers, like in many cultures. And I think for a long time, this story was one of those sorts of things. But the thing is, if you go to a village by the Euphrates River, and you tell an exciting story about building this boat, you cannot say to all these people, oh, you build the biggest boat in the world, because they knew about boats, they wouldn't be happy. They would say, well, how big is it? So, well, I don't know, it was, you make something up, and then they say, well, how much stuff do you need to build? A so, in the end, obviously, the storytellers decided they had to find out the answer. And this is what they did, I think, because um, in Babylon, in the cities of ancient Babylon, there were schools where people who were going to be scribes were taught to write and also to calculate. They were taught about mathematics and they had to solve problems. So I think probably what happened one day was one of these storytellers went to see the teacher and said, look, do me a favour, give these boys this question. If it's round and it's, it's like, how much stuff do we, how much bitumen do we have to have you know, to work it out? And so they obviously did work it out and they worked it out by asking real boat makers to get the starting numbers and then they kind of made them bigger so that these numbers, although they are huge, they are realistic. They're, they're not just a fanciful thing, they are realistic. So I suppose that when they did these productions and they told the story about the end of the world and all this kind of stuff, that they had all this information so that if someone asked, just a moment, you know, tell us about, they had all the information ready. I think that was the idea. So what is new is that we learn 
that according to this uh, tablet, the ark was round. It's a round boat. Any other differences with the Bible? Well, it was something which was very close to the Bible, very interesting, because when the animals are ready to go on board before the rains come, it is described in this tablet that they went on board two by two onto the boat, which of course everybody knows from the Bible and from the children's song about the animals went in two by two. And in this tablet, nearly 4,000 years old, this idea is already written down. So that was also rather exciting to, to see that's part of the narrative. So we can say that this tablet influenced the Bible, probably. Well, what is this? I think the story began in that culture, and this is an important bit of writing about it, and that narrative, that Babylonian narrative, was the one that worked its way into the Bible. And I think the reason is clear, because the idea that human beings are like ants, they have no power, and that God, like this, can obliterate everything, this story showed that in the end there'd be a rescue. And I think the Babylonians had this idea, and in the writing of the Hebrew Bible, the same idea was important to show the power of God and the weakness of human beings and mercy and survival. So the story was kind of um, borrowed and recycled and recycled. But there's one big difference with the Bible, because in Mesopotamia, the gods decided to kill everybody off because they made so much noise, like this lorry, <laughs> so much noise they couldn't sleep. So they decided they'd kill everybody and they'd start again. They'd invent a new species. But in the Bible, the destruction was because of sin, because everybody was wicked. So the philosoph philosophic position was different. They took a good story and they redesigned it for a different kind of audience. Your found is not just any archaeological or epigraphic found. It has a big impact because people are very interested in the story of history of Noah. So what is the impact? You became famous first? Well, not really. I'm just a curator in a museum. But the thing is about this story that everybody knows about it. And in some religions it's very important. But everybody knows the story of Noah. And you know a good idea to understand it is that it seems to me that all the films that are made in Hollywood today they're nothing to do with Noah and the boat, but they have this idea that the whole uh, of everything is going to be destroyed by monsters from outer space or dinosaurs or something, and there's one man who has 24 hours to rescue the world or it's forgotten. So it's the same kind of motif, and Hollywood has never been able to give it up. It's something very seductive because... It's all a 4,000 year story. They sold the forth and they readjusted it and readjusted it. But I think this is the idea that people sitting in the cinema when they watch a film like this, they think, thank goodness it wasn't me, you had to do it. That's probably something to do with it. But do you have reaction? Because it's considered like holy scriptures by... Yes, sometimes So you come happens. with a so version that says it's even older, it existed yes. before that. Well, I've had a lot of experience of people asking questions, how can you say this about the Bible? And there are two things, that nobody quite knows when the text of the Bible really came into existence, but However it's dated, this new piece of cuneiform is at least a thousand years older. So it shows that the story in the Bible had something beforehand, and you can't really deny it. So um, my idea is that the, the Jewish philosophers who produced this Hebrew text, as I said, they took the idea of the story and they reused it for their own teaching purposes at the beginning of the Bible. And, um, this is not so difficult to understand. So, for example, if someone is very aggressive to me, I say to them, well, have you ever tried to write a detective story? And they say, well, no, no. I say, well, you go home and you try and write a detective story that has nothing in it that's never, ever been thought of before. It is impossible, because all literature is indebted to things that came before. And this is just another example, that the text is a piece of literature with a history, and there's nothing that undermines the content of the words, but merely the structure and the origin of it. And a lot of people seem to find that this is OK once in a while, um, the people have walked out, but not very often. Sometimes an old lady will come up to me if I give a lecture and she say, I will pray for you, young man, I'll pray for you, and things like that. But on the whole, I haven't had a lot of trouble. And now, even people who went on the moon, James Irving, yeah. she is looking for the ark, he was looking for it. 
But they never, they never found it. They are looking around Mount Ararat in Turkey. Yes. Does your tablet say where the well, it does. Landed? You see, the funny thing is that um, it's clear what the Babylonian idea was because we have an ancient map on a clay tablet, an ancient map which shows the world and the mountains around the edge of the world. And the Babylonians believe that this, that, that their their story, the boat rescued, rest, rested after the waters on one of these mountains. And there's enough information um, on this map to show that, according to the Babylonians, this was in Armenia, which means that it can't be the one in modern Turkey, this Mount Ararat, for the following reason, that Ararat is not an ancient name for the Turkish mountain. It was never called that in antiquity, but the name of Ararat in the Bible comes from the Babylonian word, Urartu, which does mean Armenia. So, if you are going to go anywhere to look for this ark, you have to go to Armenia, but that's not good enough because you have to go all the way to the end of the world and then you have to sail across this ocean that no one has ever seen and then land on a mountain all the way beyond that. So it's quite a responsible job. So I would say about Mount Ararat in Turkey that I've seen many photographs of this mountain and the rocks. And depending on the time of day, the light which plays on the rocks, you can see a rowing boat, you can see an oil tanker, you can see the Queen Elizabeth II. There are hundreds of boats, if you have an imagination, there to be selected. And my last question, then I let you go. Uh, you were born in 1951, if That's I'm correct. correct. Yes. Uh, do you have any big project ahead or are you are ready to retire? Oh, or it's a passion? I'm never going to retire. I always wanted to work in the British Museum and my plan is to work there forever. And um, there's so much work to do and I'm writing lots of books. So every time one book is nearly finished, I start another one so that there's a whole list of them. Once I gave a lecture in London and um, somebody from the audience in the question said, are you ever going to retire from the British Museum? Um, um, and I said, uh, quoting from a a gangster film that the only um, way I would leave this museum is with pennies on my eyes because when Capone shot people and they were buried they always put coins on their eyes so I said you know that would have to happen first and somebody else from the audience said oh we could easily arrange that so I've never made any more jokes about it. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. <laughs>